The Tom Woods Show, episode 2335. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. As the academic year winds down, it's time to start thinking about what you're going to do in the fall. And of course, I highly recommend the self-taught K-12 through Ron Paul curriculum. Not only will your kids get the real story about everything, but they'll also learn the kinds of practical things that they won't learn in the traditional school. For instance, how to be an effective public speaker, how to manage money, and how to run your own home business. And of course, when they reach the high school grades, they will be learning Western civilization and U.S. government from old Tom Woods here. But here's the most important thing. If you're going to join, make sure you join through my link because only through my link do you get $160 worth of free bonuses. My link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. I'm delighted to have our friend Vivek Ramaswamy back with us again. A lot has happened since the last time we talked. Last time we were talking about a book. Now we're talking about a presidential campaign. So Vivek, welcome back. Good to be back. How are you? Doing great, doing great. You are appearing in unusual places for a candidate of your type. Let's say the place we might not expect to see you. So I guess I just saw a post not too long ago about you going to Chicago. And then I think you're going to Pork Fest in New Hampshire next month. Is that right? I am going to Pork Fest in New Hampshire. You're right. And I'm going, I thought you were going to make reference to my trip to the south side of Chicago tomorrow evening too, but that's what I was driving at. Yeah. You know, we're not doing things traditionally in this campaign and I'm running to lead the entire country. We're not just going to run an election where we spend a majority of the time talking to one small segment of the country. And my bet is this will actually be the electorally successful strategy. But either way, our goal here isn't to play some political snakes and ladders. We are going to speak truth at every step. That's what I'm committed to doing. And we will find out if that's the winning electoral strategy or not. I think it is, but that's just the only way I'm going to be able to do it. And so, yes, outside of Chicago tomorrow, Pork Fest in New Hampshire later, we're going to be going to Kensington, Pennsylvania. Actually, Kensington's outside of Philadelphia. It's an area where even the police won't go. But if you want to actually take on the issue of rampant drug abuse in this country in a way that has a demand side component to it that people don't want to talk about. You want to address homelessness. You want to address the mental health epidemic. You can't just treat these as academic concepts. I think you have to show up in the communities that are affected by it, offer actual tangible solutions grounded in fact and policy. And that's a big part of what I'm doing. But the trouble you face is that some of these Republican primaries are closed, which means only registered Republicans can vote. And a lot of the people you're going to be talking to are not registered Republicans. Yeah, that's true. But I also think it's part of my philosophy of why I go on Chuck Todd show and meet the press or Don Lemon with CNN is that I think, I'd like to think at least, our base rewards people who have the courage to actually face off with people who disagree with them. I go to college campuses where the majority of people in the audience aren't going to be voting in a Republican primary either. But it's my view, certainly, that if you're not willing to sit across the table from a 21-year-old who disagrees with you or an NBC host who's mean to you, and by the way, there are other Republican candidates in this primary who've said they won't talk to NBC News because they're not nice to them, then I don't think you're fit to sit across the table from Xi Jinping representing our country either. And so my hope is that by engaging in open dialogue, debate, persuasion, even of people who don't agree with us, showing up on the other side's turf and often winning that debate and even better bringing along people with us with the benefit of argument and reason and logic that wins the day. I hope that our base will reward that. I can't prove that. There's no polling data to support that. But that's how I think we're distinguishing ourselves from the rest of the field is that I'm running to lead the entire nation from day one, not just saving that for the general election. And it's a little distinctive relative to how other Republicans are approaching this. If you were Lindsey Graham or Mitt Romney, let's say, I would not ask you the following question, but you're not. You're a bright young guy who is well-read and knowledgeable. So I am going to ask you this. Who would you describe as your major influences, let's say, philosophically? Mm. I think Friedrich von Hayek is probably pretty darn close to the top of the list. I think that his argument in the Constitution of Liberty, I think, is a powerful one that makes a case for what we can in a reductive form call free market capitalism. I mean, that's overly reductive, but his pro-market theory is grounded not in some utilitarian account, 
and not even just in the ontological account of individual freedom as it relates to the person whose wealth or market freedoms are not interfered with. That's only part of the story, but also grounded in the theory of human respect that I think we've forgotten, where I think the basic case that he makes against, for example, government-ordained redistribution and equity or in programs is that it actually disrespects every human being because by falsely conflating your moral worth with the number of green pieces of paper you control, you reinforce the assumption that actually results in the loss of civic respect for people who don't have as many of those green pieces of paper. And I think that that's part of the logic that was probably most persuasive to me in offering a yang to Milton Friedman's yin in my critique against stakeholder capitalism and ESG was not simply that it posed a threat to capitalism from the overexpansionary force of politics, but rather the reverse, that actually when capitalists wield too much political power through the market itself, it actually sucks the lifeblood out of a constitutional republic or out of a democratic society where every person's voice and vote counts equally. And so over the last three years, I've been sort of aiming certainly to bring Milton Friedman's famous 1970 thesis into the 21st century, but by making the inverse of the case that he made to complete his unfinished work. But since you're asking me to pause and ask where that came from, probably the roots of it start with Hayek and the constitutional liberty. In a way, I think I owe you an apology because I know most of my listeners know you. They, I think, got to know you at first because of your stance on ESG. But what is your 30 to 60 second introduction of yourself pitch to America? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll give you a little bit of my background and my worldview. You and I have talked before, so I just got right into it there. But yeah, look, for folks who are hearing from me for the first time, I'm 37 years old. I'm a millennial. I'm the first millennial ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. And I'm doing it not as a politician, but as somebody who has lived the full arc of the American dream. My parents came to this country with almost no money about 40 years ago. I've gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies, including a biotech company where I served as CEO for seven years oversaw the development of a number of medicines, five are FDA-approved products today, and that's one of several successful companies that I've built. I stepped down from my job as a CEO to speak my mind freely as a citizen, which, funny enough as it sounds, I wasn't really free to do as the CEO of a multi-billion dollar biotech company. In the wake of George Floyd's death and the demand that I make a statement on behalf of Black Lives Matter and take a number of other positions, that woke me up to write the book that I ended up writing, Woke Inc., Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam. The emphasis was more on the ink than on the woke, actually criticizing corporations using social and political values to effectively do the work of the state in return for keeping the state at bay, sort of an arranged marriage between a neo-progressive woke left and consolidated post-2008, post-bailout Wall Street and Silicon Valley that created a new Leviathan far more powerful than what Thomas Hobbes envisioned 400 years ago. And so I've since been on something of a crusade for the last several years against the rise of ESG in capital markets, where under the myth that it's actually the invisible hand of the free market, what I've actually exposed through my work, through Woke Inc., through Capitalist Punishment, a subsequent book that I wrote, and through actually starting a business called Strive that now competes against BlackRock in the market, what I exposed was that the rise of the ESG movement in capital markets was not actually the work of the invisible hand of the free market at all. It was the invisible fist of government lurking behind the scenes, where pension funds like those at CalPERS or in the state of New York were effectively co-opting financial institutions saying they wouldn't do business with them unless those financial institutions and asset managers used all of the money they managed to vote in favor of social and political agendas, racial equity audits, emissions caps, et cetera, in corporate boardrooms that most Americans don't agree with and more importantly, which don't advance the best financial interests of their clients. And so that's what I had been doing for the last several years. But what led me to run for president was my honest reflection that as much as there is a top-down problem in the rise of this ESG industrial complex, what I call the woke industrial complex sometimes, while there is a top-down problem, the merger of state and corporate power to delegate to the other what either couldn't do on its own, that trick only works if there is a culture willing to buy up what they're actually selling. And I think that that's something that I wasn't going to address just through writing books, through top-down action, through 
even through the market alone, but by leading a cultural revival, if you will, on the demand side that addresses a hunger for purpose and meaning in my generation that I think we have not addressed in this country in a very long time. I think if you ask most people my age, what does it mean to be an American? You get a blank stare in response. The reason why is we're hungry for purpose and meaning at a moment in our history when the things that used to fill our hunger, from faith to patriotism to hard work to family, these things have disappeared. And that leaves a moral vacuum in its wake that allows fill in the blank, wokeism, transgenderism, climatism, covidism, globalism, whatever it is to fill the void. And I think what we need to do in the conservative movement is to just stop complaining about the problem and to start to fill that void with a vision of American identity that runs so deep that it dilutes the poison to irrelevance. And I think the way we do it is by embracing the ideals that set the nation into motion 250 years ago. And so I'm running for president because I believe those ideals still exist, but we need to do the hard work of rediscovering them. And I saw no better way to do it than to do in 2024, hopefully something similar to what Ronald Reagan did in 1980, to revive those ideals, to revive our national identity, to win in a landslide election and actually unite the country in the process. Well, I've heard some of your speeches and for the most part, you're spending your time putting forth your positive program rather than saying this other person running against me is a bum and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But of course, people are going to ask you about the elephant in the room, which is Trump and his massive numbers in the Republican primary polls. And you said at some point not too long ago that Trump had a chance to do things that he didn't actually wind up doing. What are some of those things that you would do? Well, I think a lot of this relates to shutting down the administrative state. Trump identified the administrative state as a problem. The reality is he didn't do much to address it, not in a permanent way, at least. I mean, take the Department of Education. Just use this as an example. This is an agency that spends $90 billion a year that in my book should not exist. It has no reason for existence. And Trump put a fine enough person, Betsy DeVos, on top of it to run it. But tinkering around the edges doesn't solve the problem. I think there's exactly one answer. When you have an administrative agency that should not exist, you shut it down, period. That is the answer. That's what I've committed to do as the next president. I think that involves getting into the details of your constitutional and statutory authority to actually do it. We can talk about the mechanics of how I would make that happen. But I've identified a list of agencies. I mean, I think the FBI should not exist. At the local level, you have a police, you have a prosecutor, you don't have an intermediary agency. At the federal level, you have U.S. Marshals and you have the Department of Justice. But when you have an entire intermediary bureaucracy, that is a formula, a cesspool for managerial corruption, for overreach, for abuse of power. Well, guess what you get? You get abuse of power. And this is not a partisan issue. The same J. Edgar Hoover FBI that tried to threaten Martin Luther King Jr. into committing suicide that now goes after its political opponents in a very different way today. Yet the whole point is that that agency should not exist if we're actually running this the right way. And I think you can both restore not only budgetary discipline, that's less what motivates me, although it's a nice side benefit, but you can restore budgetary discipline with also, most importantly, restoring a three-branch system of government, an actual constitutional republic ordained in our constitution rather than this unconstitutional fourth branch that performs most of government's functions today. And so that's an example of where I differ a little bit from Donald Trump. I think there's a lot that he could have done by rescinding bad executive orders from the past. Government interference in the market, you want to talk about affirmative action. Lyndon Johnson signed into law, or well, signed into an executive order, really a regulation, that mandated, it was executive order 11246, that mandated anyone who does business with the government to adopt race-based quota systems. I reject that vision. I would rescind that order on day one. It's one of the easiest things the next president can do. It's interference in the private market via social mandate that comes through a condition of doing business with the federal government. Well, Trump could have done it. He didn't do it. I actually pushed his people on why. They said that it was a political hill they didn't want to die on. And so I bring up these two examples. They're just examples. I think they're symptoms of a deeper approach to how I would govern that's a little bit different than Trump. This from the standpoint of somebody who, by the way, admires a lot of what he did, especially as an outsider to the system. When you're doing it based on vengeance and grievance, you can go so far. But you can go far further if you're grounded in first principles and moral authority. And that's what I'm bringing to the table that I think is a little bit different than Trump. I think that's what allow me to take much of that same agenda to the next level and to do it in a way that I think actually unites the country as Reagan did in the 1980s. That's what I think we can deliver in 2024. Let me hit on something because it would seem odd if I didn't. 
that might rub a libertarian audience the wrong way. Talk to me about your views on the war on drugs. Mm. I think that, well, maybe it'll rub people the wrong way, maybe not, but I don't think it does, or ought to, at least. So my view, first of all, is that it is a perfectly legitimate use of the U.S. military to secure our own border. So let me just hold the phone for a second because we're going to come back to it on the demand side problem. I'm not one of these conservatives that just wants to sweep that under the rug. I think we need to come back and address it. Let's assume we have the drug laws that we do now. You debate them. Maybe you want to have them. Maybe you don't want to have them. But just for a second, acknowledge the status quo that we have such drug laws. Against that backdrop, does it make sense to have a Swiss cheese of a southern border or not? And I would make the strong case that it does not. And so I've said that sloganeering and talking about building some wall isn't going to solve that problem. But rather than using our military to secure somebody else's border in God knows where, so long as we're going to have that military, we might as well use the unstationed troops to secure our own southern border. That's the case that I make. And I do think that you can end the supply side driven fentanyl crisis because I think it is no accident that you've seen a rise in fentanyl usage precisely over the same period of time that the Mexican drug cartels expanded their profit margins after China started sending synthetic inputs to make fentanyl at a lower cost that expanded their profit margin, driving up the pressure to push fentanyl across the border, especially against the backdrop of an administration that has abandoned border security. So wherever you are on the state of the current laws, so long as they are the way they are, you ought to believe in the rule of law that we actually stand by believing in the laws that we have rather than backdoor not enforcing them. If you don't like the laws, repeal the laws. But so long as you have them, enforce them even handedly, we have a border, let's actually secure it. So that's where I land on that. That is not the whole story. We have a demand side problem in this country too. And so, you know, (laughs) I don't want to front run a major announcement we're going to make. We're thinking about it around Memorial Day. But suffice to say that I think that I'm going to be adopting some, I already have, but I will be unveiling, adopting some positions that aren't very popular or historically at least very popular in the Republican Party. I'm going to lead them and lead our base to make sure they understand the reasons for why. But talking about legalization of, Schedule one controlled substances that absolutely should not be schedule one controlled substances that are far less addictive, far less dangerous than fentanyl. And at least in the context of veterans, say, who suffer from PTSD, giving them access to alternatives to address a demand side issue has to be part of a solution if we're actually concerned with saving lives. Addressing the mental health epidemic has to be part of the conversation if we're actually concerned with addressing the demand side. So I certainly don't want to be one of the members of a politician class that latch onto a solution that fall in love with it and turn it into a slogan. But I also think that I'm not going to be somebody who just recites slogans that were memorized long ago with eyes blind to the realities. There is a supply side driven component to this that a U.S. president is uniquely empowered to address by securing the southern border including using the military to do it. And I don't think that's a violation of posse comitatus if that military is restricted to literally the border itself, but also to do it in an honest way, reckoning with the fact that there is a demand side problem and that we need to address it, including through unconventional policies that many 1990 Republicans might chafe at, but actually Republicans today who are part of the America First movement and otherwise, I think would be quite open-minded to. So that's how I look at it. Hey, friends, a quick message from our sponsor, Blinkist. I can tell you personally that the kind of people I admire most, the kind of people I most want to be like, are people who have interesting and informed opinions on pretty much everything, such that I'm always curious to know what they think about X, Y, or Z. Imagine how nice it would be to be such a person. And, well, it's easier than you think, thanks to Blinkist, an amazing app that gives you the key takeaway points of thousands and thousands of nonfiction titles in just 15-minute written and spoken chunks. Now, there are plenty of books you do not want to read the old-fashioned way. You'll spend five hours reading them, and the only things you're going to remember are the key takeaways that Blinkist would have given you anyway. This is especially true with self-help books. Oh my gosh, are these books full of fluff or what? But yet, They very often do have some critical insights. Well, all I want is the insights. I don't want to waste 10 hours going through fluff. And so the books in the Blinkist 14-Day Personal Growth Challenge are a great way for me to absorb a lot of valuable stuff in a really short amount of time. 
They have an amazing new feature, Blinkist Connect, which is, in effect, two subscriptions for the price of one. You can share titles with your best friend. You arm yourself with the knowledge you can get very, very easily through Blinkist, and you will become that person people look up to and are dying to hear from, the kind of person who makes a great first impression. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. I know you and I have only so much time, so there's only one other thing I want to ask you, but I do want to ask you because I know your opinions on climate and on, I saw you speak numerous times about Silicon Valley Bank, and you were willing to stake out a position that in some circles would make you unpopular, and you just did it anyway. But I haven't, and this is probably my fault, but I haven't heard you talk about your opinions on, I can guess them, but I'd love to hear you describe them, on the public health establishment in the U.S., especially after COVID. Mm. (laughs) the biosecurity state that we have inherited. I think it is just another example of the rise of this managerial class that wields power that nobody vested in them through elections in this country. And that's back to the same thing I was saying about the Department of Education or the FBI. So it goes for the CDC and the Anthony Fauci religion that pervades the NIH and much of the national health policy establishment, which is It's a symptom of a deeper distrust of citizens, actually. And we sorted this out, or we thought we sorted this out in 1776 in this country, where the American bargain was that we, the people, the citizens, decide how we will govern ourselves rather than bending the knee to some autocratic monarchy. And the old world European view, and by the way, for most of human history, it was done that way. The view was that people cannot be trusted to self-govern, that they will lead themselves into existential traps and they don't know what's best for them. And so it requires an enlightened group of elites, business leaders, labor leaders, church leaders get together in the back of palace halls, decide what's right for the rest of society at large. Well, that old monster is now rearing its head again in the modern American moment that is fundamentally skeptical of self-governance. They don't say it in so many words, but that's really what it's about, is a belief that if people are left to govern themselves, then we won't have a habitable planet left to live on due to the existential threat of global climate change that we would die as a consequence of epidemics like that raging across the country and the world, like that of COVID-19, ignoring the fact that that same bureaucratic class we now know was responsible for creating COVID-19 in a virus that was engineered in a lab in Wuhan funded by U.S. resources against and outside of the contours of a ban on that very form of -of gain-of-function research. So put aside the merits, which I think fail on their own terms, but just on normative grounds, even if the merits were supportive of some sort of marginal public health benefit at the expense of giving up on self-governance. And by the way, the facts don't even support that that was beneficial. The facts support the opposite. But even if it were, the American way is that for better or worse, we are the quintessential place, not only on the planet, but in human history that embraces self-governance over aristocracy. And I think that one of the places we saw that aristocracy rear its head was in the rise of the post-COVID or intra-COVID biosecurity state that was temporarily established in this country. And you know, I think more of us need to be unapologetic in talking about it, because if you don't learn from your mistakes as a country, you're going to keep making them again and again. To me, that was the biggest disappointment of the midterms. I felt like the entire class of people who were responsible for what was done to us needed to be overwhelmingly repudiated, and we did not get that satisfaction. Well, I think a lot of the lockdowns took place under President Trump in year one of the pandemic. And so I think that was part of the reason why Republicans were unable to fully own that message. Same thing as it related to government spending and inflation, by the way, is I think that we have to be on firm footing in practicing what we preach. And this isn't blaming Trump or anything. This is just acknowledging fact. I think it became very uncomfortable for Republicans to stand on solid footing when it comes to reigning in government size, spending COVID lockdowns when a lot of that happened on our own watch. And so I just believe in first principles rather than towing some partisan line. So you know, I'll offend some people in my own party along the way, but that's what it's going to take to speak truth. And more importantly, that's what it's going to take to revive our national identity, which is what I'm trying to lead. What's your website? It is vivek2024.com, V-I-V-E-K-2024.com. And to tell you the truth, if you're asking, I think we would love widespread support even amongst people who came from outside 
of the traditional confines of the Republican Party. The more unique donations I get, the closer to the center of the debate stage I'll have an opportunity to be. And I think that the next step is indeed making sure that no candidate escapes from a principled discussion on the merits about what we stand for and why we stand for it. And that's my role for the next phase of this campaign. The debate starts in August, and I appreciate people's help in putting me at the center of that debate stage. Literally, if especially I, I love, I mean, I love my libertarians. I used to be a self-described libertarian myself. You might know this. I was a libertarian rapper in college, but I've since gone on to care about subjects like virtue and questions that go beyond just the scope of the relationship of the state to the individual. But I still share strong, deep-rooted libertarian instincts. And I think the Republican Party will be better off if we operate on principled foundations. And that's what I'll be bringing to the center of that debate stage if folks help put me there. And even a dollar at Vivek2024.com is a big part of how we build that movement. So thanks a lot for folks who are willing to do it. All right. Well, I'll have your site up at tomwoods.com slash 2335. Best of luck. I'm sure this is exhausting. I can't even, there was a brief moment when I considered doing this on a third party ticket just for the heck of it years ago. And I just thought even the exhaustion of that seemed overwhelming and that wouldn't be nearly what it would be like to be on a major ticket. So good thing you're 37. (laughs) I appreciate that, my man. Thank you. And we're doing all right. I'm having fun. And what makes it less exhausting, honestly, is I would rather speak truth at every step and lose the election rather than to play some political snakes and ladders game and win because that's not even winning. And there's something about that that's liberating to me. And so far, at least, has made the process far less tiring than you'd expect. It's actually been energizing to be able to engage in unvarnished open debate with all kinds of people across the country. And like I said, we'll be in the South Side of Chicago tomorrow doing the same thing. That's part of what keeps it fun. So I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much. Best of luck to you. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.